Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the first presentation of the day uh, of SpeckleCon. We're very happy to have you all here with us today. This presentation uh, includes Benedetta, Elise, and Mariella from Arab, and they will be covering automating workflows um, and how to boost efficiency in building projects using Speckle. So with no further ado, let's welcome them on stage, and I will let them also uh, introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi. OK. OK, great. So thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, we are really excited to be here today with you. Um, as already introduced, uh, the topic of our session today is going to be boosting interoperability with um, using Speckle. Um, today you will hear from Benedetta and myself. Uh, we are computational designers and data scientists based in the Milan office and also from Elise, who is based in the Melbourne office and uh, she's a structural engineer. Um, next slide. All right, perfect. So um, I will kick off today's session with a brief introduction um, into um, how we use Speckle to unlock our data and to achieve interoperability with Speckle. Afterwards, you will hear from Benedetta, who will um, describe our bound to beam framework. And finally, Elise, who will talk about um, automated uh, structural engineering workflow. So, um, for those of you who might not know Arup, we are an international uh, design and engineering practice with a strong focus on cross-discipline collaboration. This means that we use various design and analysis tools. Some of them are commercially available, while others are custom tools that we develop in-house. In Arup, we always strive to automate the boring and repetitive tasks. This usually includes also interoperability between software, um, which usually requires uh, constant imports and manual exports, a process that is prone to errors, and data loss. Creating custom code to automate the links between all these tools might be quite expensive, time consuming and difficult, if at all possible. The second part of the challenge is how to properly keep track of changes when using multiple applications within the same workflow. How to know which application is to be considered the single source of truth of our data. Is it the BIM model? Is it the analytical model, the spreadsheet, or the CSV file exported from maybe a Python script and saved somewhere in the project folder? The solution might seem straightforward to build a database to act as a single source of truth, but that comes with its own challenges. So first of all, how do we access the data from all these models in order to import it into the database? But also, how do we translate our model data into a tabular format? Well, that turns out to be quite difficult because buildings are complex and projects are usually dynamic and they change over time. They contain a lot of hierarchical interdependent data that is difficult to be captured in a single table with a fixed structure. So in our for us, the solution has been Speckle as it um, actually solves both of these challenges uh, that, that I just mentioned. It allows for a simple and comprehensive interoperability between different software but it also offers an inter independent uh, open source data environment uh, from where we can access all information and geometry. Uh, it also implements a data mechanism that supports both predefined as well as custom data schemas. So information is stored in a format which is suitable for describing complex projects and is also accessible using the Speckle APIs. In Arup, we use both the predefined schemas um, for software like Revit and uh, GSA, but we also use the custom ones for specific use cases, for instance, for report automation, for drawing automation, or maybe for designing custom dashboards. So, um, more specific, as I mentioned, we use many, many different um, ways. Uh, we use Speckle in many different ways, but today we will focus specifically on one of them. It is a custom framework that we have developed using Speckle um, with Rhino and Grasshopper. 
Uh, this framework is flexible and extensible. It has been developed to allow its implementation for different types of projects. Internally, it has the code name DIY BIM, so do-it-yourself BIM. Um, and it's also referred to as uh, the tagging script because this is pretty much what it does. It allows the users to assign or tag custom properties to geometries in Rhino. It is comprised of three, um, of three main components, a Rhino template, which defines uh, the layer hierarchy and the naming conventions to be processed by the app, a central data schema, which, stores, uh, which is stored in, uh, in the cloud and defines the data structure, all the available families and attributes and properties, and finally, um, custom user interface, which reads the Rhino template and also uh, the schema definition and creates a smart user-friendly environment using um, human UI plugin for Grasshopper. This uh, user interface does not require any um, scripting skills or Grasshopper experience to be used. And finally, um, this is the high level um, high-level workflow, which describes how we currently use this kind of framework. So we start with this uh, do-it-yourself do BIM framework, which afterwards imports data and geometry into Speckle. And from there, the data can actually be used for many different applications, for instance, structure analysis, uh, environmental analysis, maybe for interoperability with a BIM software or drawing automation, but also for um, automating our reports that go directly to the clients. And with that, I will now pass the word to Benedetto, who will present uh, two very interesting use cases using this framework. So, um, Arup has recently been appointed to design two major sport venues in Italy. So, the one that you see is the new Milano Santa Giulia Arena, uh, which is actually in construction phase and is a new district development in the southeast area of the city of Milan. And the, the arena will serve as a venue for the Olympic Winter Games in 2026. Um, and it will be subsequently used uh, for large concerts, sports events and festival um, when the Olympic Games will be, will be over. And uh, the second project is the refurbishment of the Firenze Stadium, uh, which is an outstanding uh, piece of architecture designed by Luigi Nervi in 1929. And the intervention foresees uh, the partial demolition of some stands and uh, reconstruction of new ones joining the, the actual architecture. And uh, in, the, in the new space that is creating between the old and new structure, uh, a museum and an auditorium uh, will find their place. Moreover, to uh, announce the experience of, uh, um, of the people going to the stadium, uh, also a new roof has been designed in order to, to cover the stands. Um, sorry, too fast. Okay, so um, despite the different nature of the two projects, uh, they are both unified by common challenges so and by the need to improve the efficiency of the design process. Uh, they bo both require a multidisciplinary approach and uh, some integrated workflows uh, among the disciplines, uh, since there were continuous overlaps and interactions between the work streams. Uh, the main challenge was actually dealing with the amount of data and information and models uh, that were generated by the tools used for the analysis or for the optimization process. Um, and all of these data, information and geometry is needed to uh, converge into a unique and constantly uh, updated uh, BIM model. Um, and just to give you an idea of how much uh, complexity we needed to deal with, uh, you can have some figures. So uh, for the arena in Santa Giulia, the number of profiles were more than 4,000 and with a total length of 30 kilometers, uh, while for Stadio di Firenze, the number of profiles were more than 7,000 for around 40, km, uh, 40 kilometers of total length um, for the structure of the roof. Um, the conventional approach uh, mostly required the manual update of these complex models. And as you can imagine, the time and effort spent to remodel and to reassign uh, every time new, new properties, um, these new exports were was done only when major modification occurred. 
and that caused uh, delays in information sharing between the teams. Uh, but it, as you can also imagine, uh, there may be a potential loss of information. So um, we were asked to try to streamline this process and also the modeling team, uh, since they were dealing with this such uh, complex models, um, asked us to um, try to design a new way of creating the, the geometry of nodes uh, in an automated way in order to um, handle the copying and the intersection uh, in an automated way uh, to better render the geometry of the nodes uh, in the final drawings. And uh, to tackle this, we developed an innovative and integrated uh, BAM to BIM approach, where BAM stands for Building Analytical Model. Um, so it embeds a fully digital workflow to collect and streamline all the geometries and the related structural data uh, in an automated way. And in turn, uh, it provides an exceptional user value. So um, actually, our approach has not been used just for the uh, Arup structure workflow, but also for uh, the architectural design workflow. And but it can also be easily scaled and adapted and adopted in other uh, for other disciplines, but also for other different type of um, of projects. Um, so via Speckle, the geometries are then assigned to our internal families, as Mariella showed before, and imported into Revit. Um, as, as you can see in the bottom corner of the screen, uh, the time needed to perform a complete export of geometries for the roof of the Arena Santa Giulia was around 12 minutes, uh, which is a huge reduction compared to the time estimated by the modelers, uh, which was nine days, so more than a week of work. Um, so the core of the workflow is our tagging script, uh, which is used to assign properties to each element or to a group of objects. And the main project um, properties of the elements are then extracted automatically from the calculation software, uh, which for the two projects were uh, Midas and GSA, uh, but all the properties can be overwritten and changed. So it is possible to change the type of section in terms of families and types and dimensions, uh, but uh, choosing also between all the families that we have available in our uh, Revit library. But it's also possible to select the items and assign some, some of the parameters that are native of uh, the Revit model, um, in this case of the structure of framing um, profiles, such as the start and an extension, offset values in the different directions, or uh, a cross-section rotation angle. Um, so the assigned section uh, and the element properties are then assigned to the objects as user text, uh, so they can be read and manipulated in Grasshopper script in order to be readable and to match uh, the Revit requirements uh, to be successfully assigned later as Revit parameters. Uh, once all the properties are assigned, the script runs the analysis in order to define the geometry of the nodes. So the first thing to look at is the hierarchy of the elements, uh, which is used to define which ones are continuous at the nodes and which ones are interrupted and recessed. Uh, and the uh, type of profiles, the geometry and the dimensions are used to define the offset values uh, in order to um, already assign an offset value to avoid clashes and overlaps uh, at the nodes when exporting. So once the analysis is done, the preview tab allows the user to visualize separately the different types of, uh, um, uh, of elements, to check their position, lines, um, alignments, offset, uh, etc. And it's possible to verify that everything has been assigned correctly. So uh, if there is something that is not um, correct, like in this case, the type of profile, is it's possible to uh, reassign it to the element and the um, Analysis runs again to define the, the offset and all the properties. So it's possible to um, export uh, the, the geometry directly in a correct way to, to Revit without uh, changing them in a later uh, step uh, in the Revit model. 
So uh, the geometry and all the data related are then exported to Revit via Speco. And as you can see here, uh, the video is 1.5 times the actual speed, but it's a quite uh, fast process. So uh, as said before, we could export an entire roof of the Milano Santa Giulia Arena in around 12 minutes. So it's a quite uh, fast uh, process. And uh, as you can see here, all the properties and uh, all the um, parameters that we assigned in the tagging script are then also uh, assigned in Revit. So they are actually read as parameters of Revit and uh, used for the actual modeling of the elements during the, the import from uh, Rhino to Revit. And we are quite proud to say that this workflow has been shortlisted in the NC Tech Fest Awards in 2022. So we were with other 10 uh, Arab projects and in the category of best use of, of technology for the design efficiency. Uh, to conclude, uh, despite the good feedbacks and the satisfactory results that we got in the design process of this two, two stadia, uh, we are still working on the, um, on the workflow to make it a little bit more robust and also to integrate some uh, different libraries because at the moment we are just working with European uh, structural libraries and we're currently working to uh, extend that to the USA and UK ones. Uh, we are also trying to um, consider different type of structural elements like walls, slabs, and uh, other types of uh, um, structural elements, but not, not just the structural part. As I said before, we can also uh, use the same approach for the dis different disciplines and also to um, expand and to extend the number of parameters that we are considering for the structural framing to be assigned during the tagging procedure. Um, and that is my conclusion with a nice picture uh, of our BIM model after the, the export. And now I'm leaving the stage to, to Elise. Thank you, Bernadetta. Um, much appreciated. Um, so as you might have heard at the beginning, I'm a structural engineer um, who works in civil structures, which means I work on everything that's not a building. Um, so that could be quite wide and varied um, in infrastructure. It can be anything from a jetty to a bridge um, to a railway, um, so many different types of projects. And having a tool like Speckle really enables us to collaborate on these multidisciplinary teams. For example, this bridge in Singapore um, was modeled parametrically and it illustrates how the civil structures, the buildings, the lighting, the electrical, the mechanical teams all have to work together on these large projects um, and share data in a seamless way um, to enable us to deliver projects successfully. Um, so infrastructure projects, our timelines are often quite large. Um, they can range from a couple of months to 10, 15, 20 years even. Um, so that means we have a large flow of people in and out of the project. This means we have people with different skill sets coming to the team, um, different ideas of working, um, different tools that they use. That's where Speckle, with the numerous connectors that it has, really shows its, its value. Um, in enabling different teams, different companies, different consultants to collaborate on these projects and to, to deliver us a, a superior pr um, product. Not to mention um, the massive amounts of data that's involved in these projects. Um, as BIM models are getting more and more complex and more information is put into them, tools like Speckle become really key to delivering. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, Speckle, it's but one tool in our tool chest, um, but it makes a world of difference in our projects. Next, please. So typically, um, working on an infrastructure project, we are subject to a lot of change. If you've ever designed a bridge, um, a gantry set along a railway, or even um, simple things like a jetty, alignments consistently change. This means that you might be building a structural model and all of a sudden your bridge goes from three spans to four spans. Great, now I have to go in there, move every span, every element and adjust it manually. That's obviously a pain. So if we can do it parametrically and we can use Speckle to connect between Grasshopper to our structural analysis software, in our case GSA, that can save a heap of time. Um, designs are constantly changing, geotech is constantly changing and, and reinvestigating um, the ground, figuring out different ground properties. That affects the springs that we're applying to our piles and substructures and bridges um, and essentially means our geometry is constantly updating. 
having a tool um, that having a fixed tool uh, like we would have sort of in the business as usual approach sort of limits the amount of optioneering we can do. Maybe we only have the time and the budget to look at two or three solutions. How do we pick those? How do we know we've selected the best, most efficient, most cost effective solution? We don't really. We're using past experience based on previous projects that we never know have actually achieved the most optimal solution. On each of these problems, each of this uh, manual rework is repeated on every single infrastructure project and buildings projects too. Next slide, please. So as I read from left to right on the screen, I see myself nodding along thinking, yes, this is these are reasons why we should change, why we should adopt um, smarter tools like Speckle. So I don't know about you, but I hate wasting time doing very simple tasks. I really love being an engineer so I can think outside the box, tackle the difficult problems. Um, and if I can use a tool like Speckle to save time on the mundane and repetitive tasks, then I feel like I'm winning. I can spend more time focusing on the things that are actually difficult and challenging, and I can produce a better solution. I also have more time to option it, to examine alternatives. I don't have to just um, meet what the client's asking for. I can think about different solutions. This will enable me to present to the client a solution that might not be what everyone else is, is delivering, but might actually be the better solution. So that fl flows into optimizing. We aren't just being conservative. We aren't just designing to what meets the grade. We're actually looking deeper, thinking, okay, do I actually need this amount of reinforcement here? What are my loads? Because I have the ability to run more models, and more, be more refined in those models, then I can optimize to a greater degree. And ultimately, this benefits the client. They get the best result, and we as speckle masters win more work, which is what we're trying to do. Next slide, please. So we've come up with a novel approach at ARP um, where speckle sits at the center of it, um, and it's a hub and spoke model. So that means we have lots of information flowing into and out of Speckle. Um, you can also see that uh, we use Grasshopper and Rhino quite a bit to transfer this information, but Speckle really enables us to connect into softwares that we wouldn't be able to connect to otherwise. Um, this means our uh, workflows are modular. So if we want to change software or share a workflow with a different engineering firm through a joint venture or similar, then we can. We can sub out something like Oasis GSA, which is our in-house analysis software, plug in another tool. Um, and this complements existing workflows that we already have and existing plugins um, that exist in Grasshopper. So we can use our powerful design engine, Design Check, um, to perform our calculations. Next slide, please. So I've talked about the idea quite a bit, but I haven't really got to brass tax. Um, this is a script we have uh, to produce a bridge model parametrically um, using Speckle GSA. So as you can see, um, we're working in Grasshopper, so we have infinite flexibility in how many spans we want, how many beams we want, how deep the piles are, et cetera, and that can update almost immediate, immediately. So I've worked on a six kilometer viaduct um, and we were constantly updating the number of spans and the span length. Having a tool like this enabled us to do those changes really quickly and figure out if that arrangement would work in real life. So this is very powerful. Um, and having Speckle GSA enables us to um, update not only the, the geometry, but also the loads, the springs, the analysis tasks, the combination cases. We're not just doing a part of the model, we're doing all of the model. And that's really, really powerful. So although we're generating our um, structural analysis model through Speckle, we can also use that same work, that same effort to generate our BIM models as Benedetta and Mariella have shown today. So we don't just have to work in silos. Um, all the work we've done to generate one set of geometry can be used to generate the next. Next slide, please. So this is what it looks like. Um, on the left, we have the Rhino workspace of the bridge that we were modeling. And on the right, we have GSA, a model complete with loads, um, combination cases, everything. All that's left is for me to open it and press run. And there we go, we have our bridge. Next slide. So what's next for us? Um, in Australia, we're 
continuing to adopt parametric workflows. Um, we want to expand this particular bridge script to other bridge types. So not just dealing with simply supported um, super T bridges, which is what's typical down here. We also want to incorporate other design codes. So through design check, we've been able to um, swap out these scripts so that they can be used in Australia, in the US, in the UK, and with Eurocode. We want to strengthen our links between our um, two sets of models so that information created in the structural model can be sent directly to the BIM model so that we're maintaining that single source of truth. Thank you. That's it. Um, we've really appreciated everyone joining today. Um, and thank you for listening. I think we have one question in the chat. Um, Rude asked, in what software is the initial geometry created? Um, so for my um, script, the initial geometry is created in Grasshopper um, and it's visualized in Rhino um, before it's sent to our structural analysis software. Yeah, and I guess that for our, um, it is created in Rhino as well, but it can also come directly from the calculation software and imported in Rhino for the tagging part. So it's also a geometry that can be created directly in GSA or Midas and then imported in Rhino for the tagging script. I think there was also another question for you, Benedetta, is where the tagging script is actually generated, whether it's in Reddit. Um, Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the tagging script is actually in Rhino. So um, we decided to have it in Rhino for many different reasons. The first uh, one is that it, what I mentioned before, so most of our models are in Rhino and sent from Rhino to GSA for the calculation. So um, it was best for us to have it uh, in, in Rhino. Um, and also there were some limitations in Revit for assigning parametrically um, the, the properties to the elements and sending them back to the calculation software. So for us, it was quicker and also easier to develop the script in Rhino rather than in Revit. I think I can take Stefan's question um, about how to encourage other companies to be more innovative um, and adopt these workflows. Um, I think lots of companies might be hesitant in adopting parametrics or automation um, because they fear that it's a black box. Um, but I think through the use of Grasshopper, through the use of um, careful planning to make sure the workflow is auditable um, and and checkable, um, more people will get on board. It's also not a great idea to start with the biggest um, structural project you have. Start with something simple that's repeated. Um, we've automated lots of small structures um, at Arup um, that the calculations are quite simple, but because we have to do them thousands of time times, that really adds up. Um, so I'd say maybe don't automate a bridge first um, or a stadium, um, but you'll have massive time savings if you do.